to the next in our series of uh, video podcasts. Greg Blake, my co-host, <laughs> welcome back. Video podcast, what station are we on? Well, that's the way I... That that's joke's getting I old. Uh, we're very, very pleased uh, to have with us uh, one of the trailblazers in the refereeing world, uh, Kate Jakovitz. Welcome. Thank you. Now, Kate, uh, the word trailblazer is uh, not used lightly. Uh, Greg Blake was a trailblazer in his day. Oh, blush. Look, look where he's <laughs> ended up now. <laughs> yeah, rocking around in my jammies. I've got no idea where I am or what I'm doing, so that's fantastic. What a great story it is, uh, Kate, and we'd like to spend uh, the next while talking to you about your story and, and how you got involved uh, in our great game. Uh, you grew up on the Gold Coast, is that right? Yes, correct. Born in Manly? Yes. How did you yeah. get involved in our great game? Uh, football. Um, I have a couple of childhood friends, um, two boys, George and Thomas, grew up with them, and everything they did, I wanted to do, naturally. Um, so then they signed up for football, and I was like, well, I can do that. Um Obviously, coming from Queensland, um, a lot of an NRL state, more so a rugby league state, and I wasn't allowed to play that. Mum was like, "No," and she didn't want to sit there watching cricket either. So I, oh, I chose it. football. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask you, Mudgy Burra? Mudrabar. But that, what, that's what I said. Okay. Where, <laughs> where in God's good graces is that? Um, do you know the Gold Coast at all? No, okay. I, I know all of it. Okay, so there's um, so there's the Gold Coast, and then there's the hinterland. So basically, it's Narang. Rabina, and smack bang in the middle is Mudrabar. Does it have an RSL? It does. Fantastic. You know, that's where you started, isn't it, Mudgy? Say it again. Mudrabar. That's the one. Yes, yes. You Tell didn't get all those uh, tattoos in Cavill Avenue. Don't. You? It's <laughs> not about me. <laughs> no, it's not about me. <laughs> so j- just so for those who are just tuning in um, and perhaps don't know the story of Kate, Kate became the first female to referee a Hyundai A-League game this season. Uh, fantastic performance and uh, has also refereed, Greg, at uh, the World Cup, the FIFA World Cup, the Women's World Cup. Um, and, and the final of the Under-17 World Cup as well, yes. which was... Uh, that's pretty auspicious. You've done all right, haven't you? I've, I've done okay so yeah, far. Yeah, you've done all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a bit about that uh, that big occasion, um, the Hyundai A-League, first female to, to referee uh, in that competition. What was that like for you? Um, personally, uh, I'm not going to lie, It was um, I was nervous. Um, just with everything attached to the match and the occasion, um, being the first female, I was trying to swallow all the outside expectations and, and influences but you know, naturally me being a, the person that I am obviously I want to perform at my highest level um, but there was a lot of strings attached to the match if that makes sense um, so it was a it was a momentous occasion for uh, football and Australian football but also females in the game um, just to show that there is a pathway it can be done and and let's look towards the future to to, to make it happen even more um, and hopefully a little easier than the pathway that I had as well. And so. That's what I was just thinking. Wouldn't it be nice to know that you, you mentioned Trailblazer, Michael, that at some point in the future that uh, it, it will be second nature, that women will have that pathway and that you will mm. have been the person that, that set the... Ba- but it, you said how nervous you were. Yeah. That uh, women in the future won't have to conscious of that because it'll, be, it'll just be part of the way yeah. the game is structured well I, I hope so that that's that's the goal but I mean you know someone's first game at any level at that at that um, kind of you know professional game they're going to be nervous but hopefully not having that strings attached of let's see how this female goes yeah exactly yeah and, you know, so and you being it, yeah you're being judged on your refereeing ability. How good are you as a referee? Did you get much feedback in your in your in your A League game? What, what were the blokes saying to you? Uh, the players didn't say a lot to me. Um, I had a few comments here and there. Um, so, uh, Delbridge, I think, you know, kind of mentioned on the way through. He's like, "Oh, you're the best referee I've ever had." I'm like, oh, they, all, they all say that. Um, now the game's finished. Oh, he's just trying to charm you. <laughs> exactly, right, yeah. he is a bit of a charmer. But um, yeah, uh, I think. I really only had one major decision, yeah. uh, and that was the the KMD of the the penalty kick with yeah. the Topol Stanley, um, which went to VAR review, uh, on field review, sorry, um, and which is fine. We got the right decision in in the end. Um, in terms of my overall performance, um, positioning was all right. Match management was okay. Um, I'm under no, under no illusion that the players were on their best behaviour. Yeah. Because um, Norbo uh, had a bit of a chat to me afterwards, like, Kate, I I told the boys not to speak to you after the match, and I'm like. 
Yeah, cool. I'm interested. I want, look, I want to extend on, on, on referees and, and how the game is arbitrated these days because you know how I feel about that, Michael. The game mm. is soft as butter anyway. But, not <laughs> but what I do want to ask you, now I worked in a shoe store mm-hmm. very early on about for, before you were born, actually. And that was, a, a you know, I know there are still young people who aspire to work in a shoe store. I'm telling you right now, don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's just great. But I think about professions. I think about, for example, a proctologist. At which point in your career, when you're studying medicine, do you want to go and specialise in proctology? If you don't know what proctology is, look it up in your dictionaries. Google. But <laughs> yeah, they Google. don't use dictionaries <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Holy moly, the world's just out of control. <laughs> but Kat, so that, the, the other question is, at which point in your life do you think, oh, gee, oh, look, I want to be, uh, I want to be the antichrist of football. I, I want to be the person that everybody barracks, everybody doesn't like, mm. everybody says. Which point do you go, no, nah, I want to be a referee? Yeah, right. Um, I think it was the realisation that I was never going to become a Matilda and I loved football. Um, I loved playing. I, that's my first love is playing the game. Um I don't. I remember going to my games and sitting in the car with my my grandfather, and I would always say, "Hey, Pop, I'm going to be the first female to play for Manchester United." <laughs> and you know, back then in the '90s, that was impossible because you know, David Beckham was playing for Manchester United. No female was playing. But now they've got a a, a WSL team. Yeah, that's amazing. In the in the short time that I've had a referee, uh, sorry, football career, now now they've got a an actual women's professional team yep. that is Manchester United. So once I realised my playing career was, was done and dusted, which was pretty pretty early on, <laughs> uh, at about 17, yeah, um, I was like, okay, I can, I can referee. I've been told that I can referee. I understand the game. I've been playing for over 10 years now and I'm you know, still only 17. Um, I guess that's when it kind of was like, well, I can go be an elite official mm. and get to the, the, the highest you know, stage in the world as a referee and I just kind of just let let the snowball kind of happen I I enjoy the football when I'm out there don't get me wrong there are some very low days some very dark days (laughs) some games that you come off and you just like what am I doing this for um I guess that's where resilience comes in and that's what you learn as a referee is is there a camaraderie amongst the officials the the refereeing fraternity because you mentioned how much you love playing the game and Mm. uh the and there's a, a lovely sort of closeness when you're at club level. You've got mm. teammates. Is it, mm. Do you have teammates in the in the officiating kind of game? You do, you do, and I I guess that's where uh, my love ha- for the game has expanded uh, since becoming a, a FIFA referee. I've met people from all around the world, and I've got friendships from in multiple different countries and cultures. And and this is where I re fell in love with the game. That look what it's opened my life up to um, I'm not just here in Australia experiencing one culture now I'm going to I've been to China I've been to Japan and Korea I've been to Jordan um, Bangladesh Sri Lanka and that's just the name Tajikistan Mm -hmm. I would never in my life have traveled to to Tajikistan before but I've spent a month there and I've just been able to experience that's a book a month in test chick, but where yeah, it is again? Tajikistan. That's the way. That's where it's going. It's amongst all the stands. So um, I could write a book actually of where I've been, and that's where I've re fell in love um, with with my life and and where football's taken me. Um, it's one of the the challenges, isn't it, of, uh, of sporting bodies uh, right around the world, and uh, football Victoria is no different. Is uh, attracting referees, and you've just highlighted why. Um, young kids, boys and girls should mm. should uh, perhaps try it, right? Yeah. So the opportunities that's given you. Yeah, for sure. There was a study done um, many, many years ago uh, about uh, match officials. And it was done, I think it was done in South Australia, so it doesn't really count. You know? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> have you ever tried West End beer? That's <laughs> <laughs> on, but, uh, and uh, it was based on um, surveying crowds at, uh, at footy games, soccer, etc., and uh, regardless of what happened, it, it's, it, the team that lost was always, always the referee's fault or the, the umpire's fault. And the teams that won, they were really happy with the official on the day. So you're always going to have enemies, aren't you? How does that feel? Just from a personal point of view, you can be as professional as you like, but how do you stomach the fact that you're always going to be someone's enemy on a given day in a sporting event? And that's fairly, I mean, that's fairly emotional in itself. Mm. Um well, personally, I I think it's about disassociation between that that emotion and 
and being pragmatic and looking at a game in terms of just decision making. Yes, you have to accept the fact that someone's going to be unhappy with you, but I'm going to say it right here, right now, referees are their biggest critic. Like whether the the crowd is going to hate me for a decision, I'm going to hate not hate myself. That's very strong, but I'm going to know when I make that decision and it's the incorrect decision. Like and they stay with you. They they haunt you. You learn from them. And you can't say sorry, can you? It's because I've it's said done. sorry. You've said sorry. I, absolutely. What they say? Well, Look, they can't. That's bloody helpful. Now you've I, just I, lost I, the game. Ask for <laughs> ask a team from Moulin Bar, and probably it was about two thousand and I don't know, maybe two thousand, two thousand and one. How I destroyed their their whole season when <laughs> oh, there was a it was going down the left hand side of the field, and I knew that this tackle was going to come in. It was like two players were flying down the left-hand side and it got to the goal line. And this guy has just jumped, launched himself, completely just wiped him out. It's a yellow card. And I put my whistle to my mouth because I knew it was going to come. And I've blown it. But he's cut the ball back to someone, to a striker who's on the corner of the penalty area. And he's hit it first time. And as I'm blowing the whistle, I have ridden that ball into the top (laughs) right-hand corner. And I've gone... Holy crap. <laughs> oh, my God. But I've already blown the whistle. Yeah. So I have to give the yellow card and play a free kick from there. Ask that team. They they still dislike me. And, and quite rightly so. I destroyed their year because that was them to get into the, 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 fair the, old the top shoulder. four. That's a fair old emotional I, burden. I, I, I hold that. But now I've learned to hold my whistle. And so like now fast forward like 10 years – in the under-20 World Cup, there was a, a challenge goalkeeper on an attacker and she's completely wiped out the player. The player's flipped over, the ball has come out underneath, then the player's landed on the ball and it's gone into the goal. If I had blown the penalty, it wouldn't have been a goal. But because I've waited, watched the ball, it's gone in the net, now I can just call a goal instead of you know a red card penalty for... Uh, I'm very impressed, very well, circumspect. And this, this, is what, this is what refereeing... Teaches you, I guess. Like, yes, I'm I'm the enemy of this this club from Wollumba, but now, as a as a from where, by the way, M- M- Wollumba. Okay, tell <laughs> <Yeah. So laughs> so us somewhere near Mugabara. Or yeah. <laughs> we, we we like as commentators and as ob- observers of the game not to talk too much about referees, mm. but since the advent of the VAR, there's been a lot of discussion uh, around uh, this new innovation and whether it's good or bad for the game. Mm. Most people, I think, tend to lean on the bad side. Mm. What's your view? Is it, is it make, does it make refereeing a game easier or harder? Because oh, you're, you're part of the VAR, yeah. right? You're part of the VAR panel yes. in, in the A-League game, yes. so you're sitting in that, in that room and... Mm. Uh, um, we've seen some of the conversations and decisions and how mm-hmm. they're made and how quickly mm-hmm. they need to be made. Yes. Uh, so tell us a bit about your experience. Um, mm, I like VAR mm. when it's used correctly and within its within the protocol and within its parameters and, and what it's used for. The, how to define clear and obvious, that's interpretational, um, obviously, and, it, and, it's, and it's quite, quite hard to define. Um, but I think as the game grows or like you know it's evolved we really we have to start to accept that it's part of the game and this is where modern footballers is kind of going because with the introduction of technology and the way that technology is just you know increased tenfold it's in its introduction to the game is kind of you know it's going to be the way Uh, and, and we as much as the traditionalists of football you know, can't accept it. I think this is the way it's moving because now we've got super slow-mo and people sitting at home saying, hey, well, that was a handball or this is what happened. You can see it on the, the, the thousand replays that you have at home. But as a referee, you see that one time from one angle in one speed and you have to make a decision. But, but, but surely that, and, uh, if you, and I noticed your, your hand gestures went straight towards me when you talked about <laughs> all the old farts <laughs> that sit at home. <laughs> but That's can, interpretation. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I've got to say, uh, and I wanted to, to broach this with you anyway, but um, why is it inev- inevitable that technology becomes so much a part of the game? It, it, people say it's inevitable, but I still don't understand why, and I don't think the validation that people at home have got access to slow-mo and everything else, because... If players are subject to uh, human frailties and flaws on the field, why not just leave it to the arbiters of the game? It almost tells me that the arbiters of the game, the referees of the game, don't know what they're doing because they need this extra support. You just make your call and that's it. Because the general public or the general fans cannot accept a mistake when they see it at home. And they, they can't differentiate between, or they can't separate 
what the referee actually sees, which you're not going to unless you've actually stood in that position where the referee is and seen it in real time versus how they're seeing it sitting on their couch from the three different angles. If they can tell me the decision based off the main camera output that they see from live view and be like, tell me that was a free kick or that was a handball or, you know, and tell me straight away, I can accept that. But when they're trying to tell me after the third or fourth replay and it's slowed down yeah. to like 50%, then they still can't accept that, well, that's not what the referee saw. You're basing your decision <coughs> excuse me, off the fourth time you've, you've looked at it. Yeah, yeah. So it's either accept that the referee is going to make mistakes, the same as players. I would. W- yeah. Or we get the right decision. And, and this is where the balancing act in VAR comes in for me is getting the correct decision but getting also the correct outcome for the game. Um, and it's that fine balance between the two. And that's where I guess clear and obvious comes in. And that's where the protocol comes in. And we can't just pick and choose what we use VAR for. Um, that, that's, that's kind of where I sit with it. I think it's good for the game in terms of getting the, the, correct, the big correct decisions right but not destroying it so we're looking it down to the like the scientific measurements. But this, see, this is where my concern is, that yeah. technology uh, 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 develops exponentially every year, and mm. you don't want to get to a point where people like yourself, who apparently, apart from that mob from, where is it? Mob Woolab- M- Woolab- Woolamba. Yeah, but they, well, they, they don't like it, but we don't care. <laughs> 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 but uh, but other, you, know, it ta- it, you don't want to get to a point where great referees, great officials, almost uh, 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 don't have any responsibilities at all because it becomes a technical mm. kind of game. Like American football, you know, where, where everything evolves, uh, revolves around technical camera, mm. slow-mo, mm. crap. Mm. It's crap. And you're not yep. crap. You're lovely. I don't want to spend all of our chat on specifics of rules and regulations, but there's one area that I think a lot of people would love to hear your view on. This is the, uh, the one that I think most punters, most commentators still get confused about, and that's the handball. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there have been some changes around yeah. that over the, over the last 12 months. Mm. Can you explain it to us in simple right. terms, very, how it works? Very, very simple. Um, okay. Natural playing position versus unnaturally bigger. Yeah. Um, that's what the priority is in terms of handball. We can add a couple of other considerations. That is, was there an additional movement? Mm-hmm. So that's if my arm's here and I've moved towards the ball. We talk about deliberate versus un- not deliberate. That's now been taken out of the law book in, t- in terms of, well, what does deliberate actually mean? That's still interpretational. And people are saying, well, he's not even looking, or the player's not looking at the ball. Well, does that mean they didn't deliberately leave their arm up there, mm. if that makes sense? So it's about the action and the behaviour of the player and, and what is their intention. And it's very hard to measure intention. But... Natural playing position is, you'd say, hands by your side. It's explicitly in the law that shoulder level or above, doesn't matter whether it, where it's come from, if your arm is shoulder level or above, this is not a natural playing action for a player, even when they're jumping. So I was going to ask, when you're jumping and you your jump, arms are up here, that's fine. hit your arm here? That's okay. It's okay. As long as it's underneath the shoulder level. So you can accept that this is a natural playing action, but you cannot accept when they're coming down that the arm goes up with the uh, Gerard Piquet Mm -hmm. in the the World Cup and also the Topple Stanley in my match. Which is yours, yeah, Yeah, exactly. Where the arm has gone directly up and you're like, hang on, Mm. is this a natural playing action? And that's what you kind of have to ask yourself. Holy moly. I'll tell you what, that's four minutes I didn't understand. (laughs) 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 No, it's it's, uh, it's really, really, uh, just even by dint of you Mm. trying to expand on that right then, Gives you some understanding of how difficult it is to referee mm. because, well, you know, everything that you just memorize, all this stuff, which yeah. I, you know, I, all I can do it is stupid hand gestures. But, yeah. but uh, so there's also one when the player slides in, Blakey, and, uh, you know, their, hand their hands are where, the, where do their hands go? Well, what's natural when you're sliding for a ball? I've got no idea. You know, something else, can <laughs> I just tell you, Kate? Well, the, the, the thing, physiology, uh, is it physiology? Sure, let's go with that. But can we? Because <laughs> I didn't train for, <laughs> for no years to learn this stuff. But you know the other one that confuses me, and I, I, I'm not going to go on about it, but you know when a player uh, gets hit and, 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 and hits the deck and rolls, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's physically not a thing. You can, I can upend you, Michael, as you walk down the corridor. You can't you put yourself on the top of a hill and try and roll. You have to... Rolling That's is true. crap. 
Yeah. And they should be picked up. Yeah. Players should be picked up for, for fake, what's it called? Uh, simulation. 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 You can't roll. You can't roll. Try it now in your lounge room. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just mm-hmm. saying. Yeah, anyway. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. I agree. One, of the, one of the things I was, you know, doing some reading in prep, preparing for your chat mm. and one of the things that's always fascinated me kate is um we, we're we play a global game and you've refereed in some amazing countries some far ends of the world tajikistan <laughs> how do you communicate <laughs> with players is, is english the universal language surely there are times when people cannot understand yes. you yes yeah, yeah. absolutely there's and i guess that's where we can do the ali reza style with the the multiple whistles um, which which works. Uh, Tell us about that. The, just the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if you're blowing your whistle, they can't talk to you yeah. or they can't do anything to you. So, right, it's so just telling them to shut up, basically. Basically, yeah. yeah. Like Sounds like, like my pacemaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, or then it's taught, we uh, get taught about body language and yeah. facial expressions and, you know, no is a universal yeah. or like a... Huh? Like, yeah. you know, just any sort of noise uh, seems to get through to them. Um, that you can always find, I, I've always found one player um, on the field that can speaks, understand you. Yeah, yeah, speaks English. I mean, I've referee, I think I did Spain, Paraguay, I think. And uh, the Paraguay team didn't speak any English. And I was trying to communicate to her in English, and she's yelling at me in Portuguese, I think, or Spanish. And, um, so we're just going back and forth. It's going nowhere. <laughs> and the next minute, this, this Spanish player, this young Spanish player just comes up and like, starts translating for us. Being like, <laughs> she could see that we're just going around in circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing was happening. And she was like, right, I got this. This is during a World Cup game, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah an yeah. under-20 World Cup game. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was quite, quite fascinating. Yeah. But um, I've, I think now the game's growing. It's, yeah, I guess com- language is a universal thing and, and doesn't have to be just yeah. words. The women's game, if mm-hmm. I if I may, I, I've spent a couple of years now working for Heidelberg United, and uh, calling all their women's game, mm-hmm. and I to me, and I, I watch it. I've, I've done. I've, I looked at some studies as well, but the women's game is officially, statistically tougher than the men's game, almost as if they've got something to prove when they're out on the paddock. But they hit, and they hit with <laughs> with venom, with mm. intent, and. Uh, there, there was a study done, and this is fair dinkum. Um, if you want to look on your, your Googles, is it? Google machine, yeah. On your, on, your <laughs> w, on your WW thingy. But studies have shown that women are twice, uh, that they get up twice as quick. No, half as, I'm going to go again with this. It takes mm. them less time to get up off mm. the deck once they get knocked over. Mm. And also they, they, they're twice as likely not to go down in a yep. challenge. It is a so the women play it tough. Mm, yeah, for sure. And I, I, I don't know. Maybe is it an honesty and integrity thing that that's that they just play with some purity. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen that video of that Scottish player who dislocated her kneecap, yeah. and then she's like hitting it back in place, <laughs> oh, trying to that. trying to no. continue yeah. to play. Like she's literally just. I needed a cuddle after I watched that. It was. And just I was just like, weird. wow, okay. Yeah, this yeah. Like, I think your kneecap is in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think playing is your priority right now. I didn't right get a cert two in doctrine for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, yeah, so you, you, when you're out there, you, you're really conscious of, of, of the women. They're just so tough. They are. They are. And, and it, does, it does make it difficult to, to referee um, and especially transitioning between the women's game and the men's game because, you know, the men, I think, simulate a lot more than the women. Um, you know, when the women go down, you know there's contact. Yeah, absolutely. When the men go down holding their face, you're like, What's that? What's that? I don't know. Or if they roll. Yeah. <laughs> the obvious question for, for me was the, the transition into the A-League. We touched that for you. Mm. That you've got more games coming up, which is great. Yeah. Um, and we'd love to see you there every week. Mm. Um, the pace of the game, it's quicker. How do you, how do you cope with that? Um, the Okay. The pace in the women's game isn't much slower than the men mm-hmm. because the women's game breaks down a lot more. So you're doing a lot more transitional work through right. the middle because they like they say they go forward and they go forward with intent so mm. let's say they play the long the long ball so that's fast but then they can't hold possession and they come back the other way so it's like doggy 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 yeah doggy. right whereas the men's game you can see that they try to build up play they try to go through the middle uh, occasionally they will go the long game it depends on what teams you you have and the tactics that they have um so the long balls are obviously faster yep. um, because they can kick them harder faster longer 
and you've got someone who's running on the end of it who's obviously faster. So when that comes into the men's game, yes, certainly it's faster. But when you've got teams like a, a Melbourne City or a, like a, maybe a Brisbane Raw, they build they build up the, the play. So yeah. it's a lot slower in transition. So you've got more um, breaks between long your doggies. runs. Yeah. yeah, your doggies. <laughs> um, so you can actually position and, and you can anticipate where the ball's going to go next, um, especially in the women's game. Kind of, you know where the ball should go, but sometimes it doesn't go there. Yeah. Whereas the men's game, nine times out of ten, it's going to go there. I'm fascinated by the sports science and and the GPS tracking and all that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. I'd imagine you you do all of that. Mm. Did you compare your data from the the men's game and, yeah. and the women's game, and yeah. how did it compare? Yeah, it certainly it, it you run more. Yeah. Um, I think because the runs are longer, uh, and it doesn't break down as much in the middle, so you're actually running more penalty area to penalty area rather than maybe halfway in between. Um, your sprints, there's a lot more sprints that are faster. So how many sprints would you do? Did you do in the, the oh. men's game? I can't remember. No, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, that game, the one that I had, City, Newcastle, was unexpectedly open. So there was a lot more long balls. I was expecting more build-up play yeah. through the middle. Nope, nope. It was, it was a much open game. Um, so I think I would have done at least 20 to 30 more full longer sprints in this in that game compared to a W League game. And how many Ks would you track in a game? Uh, 11. Yeah. 11. Uh, it, did, it varies between positioning styles. Um, there's two different type of positioning styles. I'm not going to get into the semantics of refereeing positioning, but yeah, yeah, if I sit more of a high line, I'll run less Ks. But if I'm more chasing the ball, if that makes sense, yep. I run more because okay. obviously I'm following the ball. That is in uh, look. I'm exhausted listening to you. To be honest <laughs> with you, Kate. <laughs> but uh, you know, 11 kilometres, 12 kilometres in the game. That's as much as a quality midfielder in any team. Um, uh, so, and, and you're doing sprints and doggies and all sorts of uh, you know sit ups or whatever the bloody hell you're doing. But <laughs> by the end of it, I mean, uh, by the end, you know, you're getting 70, 80 minutes. Fatigue must set in and affect your decision making. Um, is that something you're conscious of as referees? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, towards the, the, the last 15, 10 minutes, uh, sp- that's probably when the game opens up the most as yeah. well. Um, the players are fatigued too, so they don't want to you know, try to hold possession. They'd much rather just send it long and kind of stand there. Um, we're the ones that are having to chase and, and keep up with it. Uh, I guess that's where um, like teamwork comes in a lot more. You've got your assistant referees as well, so a little bit more responsibility may fall on them if you're maybe caught behind a little bit too far. Um, but you always try to... Um, I know for me in that Melbourne City game, my first one, um, just trying to get ahead as, as quickly as I could. If I saw a transition or a loss in possession, I'd be like, I'm gone. Mm. I have to go um, because they're looking to go forward straight away. So I have to go forward straight away, but two seconds earlier. So there's that in- anticipation, there's that reading the game um, and understanding like who are their target players? Well, they're targeting like McLaren, for example. And there was one, one sprint, full field sprint, where it went from one penalty area to the other, and I just didn't leave early enough, so I was just basically just running as hard as I could. And luckily, McLaren put it over the bar, <laughs> um, you know, from a from a first time header. Like if he had brought that down and then had a one v one challenge, we're, we're in trouble. But yeah, you just got to do your best, find your angle. The A League introduced full time referees last year. Um, it's only a small number, isn't mm-hmm. it? And it, does, has that grown this year? Uh, by one, I by think, one. yeah. Are you on the full-time panel? No. So you have a, a, a part-time job. What, how do you manage your commitments mm. with football and refereeing mm. and everything else? Um, before the World Cup, so back in, in 2018, I took 12 months off right before the World Cup because of the, the expectation of, uh, I think we had four seminars that we had to go to because we were learning VAR at the same time. Um, so I took uh, full-time, I stopped working. I, I'm a s- student. As well, I, was, I study psychology. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so I just really haven't gone back yet to full-time work because I'm just trying to finish finish up my studies. But um, I guess after the World Cup, then the priority bec- turned into A-League and ensuring I got my spot on the A-League. And then the next was the Olympics, fingers crossed, um, but we're still unknown. So I'll revisit work or part-time work afterwards. But since... The game's changed since 2018, um, or even since the last World Cup, and it's really fi- and It's really difficult, and a lot of the girls are finding it difficult to hold down a full time job. I was going to say, with all the commitments you've got in Asia, W yeah. League, A League, 
yeah. where's where's the time for work right no. and yeah and the expectation around training as well um yeah. being on the fifa program and the candidates program the expectation is training six days a week um and fitting in do you work sleep that. do you get a chance to just have a snooze every now and then <laughs> i guess that's what i sacrifice work <laughs> for <laughs> so i can sleep so where do you work what do you do for work not, 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 not at the, the moment. moment. So you've taken that, that 12 months off. Well, she, she <laughs> no, studies Kate, psychology. Kate said she'd taken refer- 12 months off last year. Yeah, I know. But World Cup to, to do, that's why. See, that's why she ended up being AFF referee of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah, she's sure. devoted, uh, yeah. Michael. Down like you and I, don't have a passion for anything. Oh, I don't have a passion for anything anymore. <laughs> but the, well, I turned up in my jammies. <laughs> there has to be a time very soon that referees like Kate become full time, right? Oh, well, you would have hoped so. She's a quality um, young woman. I hope so. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it is moving into that that realm, I guess, and with all the the new um, CBAs with with women's like the, the Matildas and now the W League, and you know, you've got the the precedent set by cricket and now AFLW moving in. Um, I think AFL also moved to supporting uh, uh, their AFL umpires, the 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 two females. Um, that, that are contracted with AFL. Um, so hopefully watch this space. Um, but I certainly think it, it's it's getting to that point. 36, 35 next mm. week? Well, in, in April, I should say. My age? Mm. 35. How long is the lifespan of a referee? How long, when you look at what you're doing now, and you clearly have a passion for mm. it, what do you consider uh, is going to be your lifespan as a, as a match official, a um. referee? I don't. I haven't really asked myself the question if I want to continue officiating after at a, I finish at an elite level. Um, I'd certainly like to go around one more time for the uh, the World Cup cycle, okay. so the 2023 cycle. Yep. Um, and I'll reassess like my body, time commitments, where I am in my, in my life. Like, do I want you know other challenges? Yeah. Yep. Um, if I want to go for a third World Cup, the demands of of elite refereeing is increasing every cycle. Like the change between 2015 and 2019 was was massive, and I'm I'm anticipating a, another jump with um, the 2023 20, cycle, and I'm, I would imagine that another jump would happen after that. Uh, FIFA are really pushing uh, women c- going into uh, elite men's football, uh, as you saw in, in Europe with with Stephanie um, and a few of the other girls as well. So I can see we- fem- female officials moving into that male elite environment and therefore the demands on the body increases again um so i guess i got to play it by every four-year cycle but to answer your question i think the best of my knowledge last year at the at the world cup there was a a north korean referee who actually played at a world cup and then she's refereed too and she was 43 okay and that was incredible. North Korean. North Korean. In- incredible she was allowed out of the country, Blakey. <laughs> yeah. Now, just to prove I've done my homework, uh, uh, Kate mentioned Stephanie. Stephanie Frappart yes. is her name. She Look at she you. refereed the European Super Cup final between Chelsea and Liverpool last mm. year. Am I right? Mm. Yep. Don't Would say you? I don't do my homework. No. Would you like me to get a glass of your own bath water? Well done. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking very, very proud of yourself. I, I, I love. I, I, you know, we've done a few of these now, Michael, and uh, I've. Uh, this is really engaging. I'm fascinated by uh, your journey and uh, what you've told us. I, I'd like to just extend on that a little bit. As a referee, and, and, and I have this discourse back in back in the day when, when, when I was first involved in the media and so forth, and Michael, you probably remember, you know, Dennis Futsinas and Chris Bambridge and these referees who were... Eugene's uh, Brazali. Eugene's Brazali. And these yeah. blokes were, were just... Um, they were lovely, normal, down-to-earth blokes who would engage uh, with players on the field, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a very real manner, mm. you know. We'd, I've heard so many anecdotal pieces about... You know, Bambridge or somebody going mm-hmm. up to a player who's, if, you know, you're playing crap and they're just, well, you're referee. <laughs> He's got a great story. He you're refereed ref- Maradona in a World Cup, Chris Bambridge. He did too. Wow. Yeah. In 86, yeah, 86. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, th- there was a real engagement and, and a real kind of respect and regard. And I, I watch some of the referees today and I just feel like they, they look a bit like uh, stormtroopers, imperial stormtroopers with it. But, you know, with and they don't engage. Is, is that something that's... Um, that you learn about, I mean, you study psychology, so mm. you'd understand some of that, the psychology of this. Mm. But what are you taught? What are you, how are you, how are you kind of arbitrated to, to mm. engage with players on that level? I guess they, uh, they kind of let that happen organically um, in terms of 
they they encourage you to use your personality um, but they they acknowledge that there's different personalities between referees so they can't exactly just say you know copy paste select all go yeah, do yeah, go yeah. do the same thing over and it's over computer again computer talk wasn't yeah it? <laughs> <laughs> control all <laughs> no, um, not cut <laughs> cut <laughs> piece of paper oh, paste you, what clag you he's getting funny or isn't he clag <laughs> <laughs> you still got clag at home maybe. I've got a glue stick in my bag <laughs> um but I guess yeah, like it's it they they try to allow the referees some flexibility in that. So it's up to the individual referees and and our individual individual personalities. Um, and I guess it's 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 interesting because like I'm now on the VAR panel and I can hear what the referees are saying to the players yeah. and they they do have that engagement. But then looking from the outside, if you're not actually hearing that dialogue, you wouldn't tell that that this is happening. Okay. From from an outsider perspective or a, or a fan perspective. Um, what about you personally? Do you me? like the banter? Uh, I I do, I, I do. Um, it would depend on what what I'm kind of receiving. I, I feel like I'm a bit of a chameleon. With um, you know, like if a player wants to, you know. Be a smart ass. I'm more than happy to be a smart ass. Are we allowed to say that? Uh, yeah, that I'm sure. I didn't know that. I was sure. worried about crap, but I'm going to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. See, groundbreaking. Yeah, right, there You're we go. You're crushing it, Kate. Yeah, trailblazer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting point because uh, I know FFA have tried in the past to push for those conversations to be broadcast on Fox, and I know that um, working with Fox, Fox is always looking at ways to increase the viewer experience right and uh, FIFA say no we can't do that very strict on the way we manage our mm. game and but I think that would be great it, to hear those conversations not throughout the whole game mm. but when those big big decisions are being made to mm. hear that conversation between the referee and the VAR so people at home can hear what's being mm. discussed mm. look don't get me wrong there's a big difference between Kate the referee in the A-League and Kate the referee on a on a Victorian you know community game there's definitely different levels of professionalism that you kind of have to bring. Not a lot, but oh, I don't know. There's that's interesting. I, I so can, who I are you do, right now, Kate? Which I'm, I'm, I'm the normal. I'm being normal. I like right. you that I, way. I think you're lovely. That's, that's fascinating. So yeah. do you do you ref- officiate in community, like in yeah. state league and yeah. NPL? Yeah. And so so yeah. on a weekend, uh, we head down to Mornington <laughs> and we might see Kate yeah. re- refereeing a state league one game. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I haven't done State League 1 in a while, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so most weekends you're out doing NPL or yeah. whatever the case may yeah. be. Yeah. Yep. So would you ever think to, to do an A-League game and just make a point when they do the soft thing or they do a bit of rolling or something and you just make a point of saying, look, the W League's much harder than you, Sonny. <laughs> well, you I'm going to use that. I'm going <laughs> to put that up my sleeve. <laughs> no, I mean, now, like, I mean, Kate, uh, like when I referee on the W League, um, for example, I, like I've refereed those girls for 12 years now. So there's a lot of different relationships that yeah. I've built and I've you know, grown up with them in a sense. So I'm able to have that kind of level of conversation and, and banter and, you know, they give it to me and I give it to them and, um, you know, don't and get a lot of, um, don't get a lot of that. But like in the early days, um, like Lena Kamis and, and Ellie Brush, there was a, a bit of a tussle between them and I'm standing there and it's either a goal kick or a corner. I'm like, I actually don't know. And I'm looking, I'm like, corner <laughs> and and then Ellie's like Kate Kate I didn't touch it I, honestly I didn't touch it I'm like goal kick and then Lena's like you can't do that uh, and I'm like yes I can I trust it like and Ellie's the type of player that I, I trust because I've, I've refereed over so long and she is quite a trustworthy person and Lena's just I can't say the word that I want to say, but <laughs> she's yeah, she can. gives she gives it a bit gr- of a, a nudge in it. She's a, a fierce competitor. That's how I'm going to put her. A yeah. fierce competitor. But she understood. She she knew and she accepted that. Well, I can change my decision because I trust you, and um, we're being honest here. But she was like, "Hang on." And sorry, I was no, just, go on. I yeah. was just going to say, and that that's I think that's the difference that, that I'm talking about because that is respect because you've grown a relationship with these people as opposed to professional courtesy, which is mm. a, an entirely different thing. Mm. But you've earned your stripes and mm. your respect, and and that's something that happens over the journey. Absolutely, yeah. We touched on trailblazer. Sam Kerr is a trailblazer. She's one of the uh, pin-up sports people in Australia. Don't worry about male or female. Um, you've no doubt um, refereed her on. Hundreds of occasions. <laughs> What's she like on the pitch? Uh, I'm going to put her in the category of fierce competitor yeah. as well. Um, does Sam see logic when she's fired up? Sometimes. <laughs> does Sam see logic when she really wants to win? Not all the time. Yeah. Um, 
and and it's hard to have that communication when you know players especially when there's those live screens on the on the you know, replays and then they're like, hey, just look at the, the screen. I'm like, yeah. I can't look at that. <laughs> I've made my decision here. And just trying to have that communication with her. But Sam is an amazing ambassador and an athlete, number one. But what I've always found with her is that she's um, – a real person as well and off the field you you go to you arrive to the field and she's like oh hey Kate you know haven't seen you in a while like how you been and she was always having a chat um and I don't think that's anything else but other than just her genuine um sincerity as a person um she's she's kind she's warm-hearted and and I love that and I and I like how she can completely transform into this um you know this leader um she she leads the way in her, in her team and on the field and she's very difficult to manage. Don't get me wrong, like her kind warm heartedness off the field, you know, <laughs> becomes very tricky on the field. Um, but I I've never felt she's crossed the line and and that's the difference between professionalism for me. Um, and I, I I referees appreciate appreciate that level of all right. I've I've had my I've had my say. Um, and and they leave it there. I want to touch on the World Cup. Um, we, we briefly mentioned it earlier, but uh, you were in France uh, at the Women's World Cup, a tournament where Australia was expected to, to go deep. Um, so you're there as an Australian referee. Talk us about that experience and, and what was it? was a huge tournament. You mentioned the advancement in ref- officiating over the last four years. This tournament was the biggest we've seen ever. Yeah. The record, the numbers, uh, TV numbers, the attendance numbers broke all types of records. Yeah. What was it like being there as part of this major tournament and officiating yeah. it? Um, well, being a part of FIFA World um, and and that, the refereeing team, um, from the beginning you knew it was going to be something special. Uh, the way that they they trained us and, and I want to say groomed, um, developed us from – you know, 2016 onwards, we just felt like we were part of a movement mm. and they wanted it to be the best refereeing performance um, ever at a World Cup, at a Women's World Cup. And that's what that was the message. And the message was reach higher. So ev- every t- training seminar that we went to, it was like we're going to – it's about self-development, self-betterment. So that's – I'm going to preface the, the World Cup experience with mm. three years of that. And what that does to you as an individual and, and, and as a team of referees is uh, it exceeds everyone's expectations and you go out there you inspired, motivated to, to bring your best refereeing performance and, and it really did felt like we were, we were on show um, and that we were all part of the show. And I, I have to credit uh, FIFA and, and the, the refereeing um, you know, team of... How, how, how they did that and I felt inspired and I loved being a part of it and I knew that I was prefer- prepared from the moment that I stepped out onto the field. My, and my first game was unexpected, um, being match, de- match number two, <laughs> um, Norway, Nigeria. Uh, and it's it was, always a big one. Yeah, yes, <laughs> <laughs> it was. <coughs> and um, I was with a completely new team as well. Um, I, was, I was with a, a, an American and a Canadian, which hasn't really – isn't really done normally, um, cross confederations. Uh, but to me, that was the most mind blowing experience being involved in football. Um, you know, there, it wasn't a massive crowd compared to my next game, but they just they just loved the football. They just loved the the, the environment, the the experience, the atmosphere, and they just loved the football. And, and Nigeria put on a show, and Norway put on a clinic um, because that's the way they they prepared. And um, you know, three goals. Everybody loves to see goals. Yeah. I didn't care who was scoring, but um, it was just amazing just to hear the roar of the crowd. And credit you, Kate, because that you're talking about the, how it stepped up. In it, but you ended up being one of the panel of ten or eleven mm. that, uh, after the group stage, yeah. were guaranteed a game right through. Yeah. Which is like if I like referees, which I don't, <laughs> but that is hugely uh, a credit to you. What a wonderful experience, yeah. and how profound that is to get that sort of, I won't say gratification, but that acknowledgement that you are mm. really, really good at your craft. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I I think as referees also we get lucky a little bit, like the fact that Australia didn't qualify for the final rounds or the after the round of the quarters. Um, did they play a quarter? No, they got round 16. Round 16, yeah. knocked out, yeah. Yeah. So that's when the cut kind of happened, um, or the release, I should say, and... 
if Australia went through, I don't know what would have happened to me. Um, so I guess mm. that's the kind of the, the politics that, that that's involved with refereeing selection. Um, with, if your country's still still at the tournament, can we really stay on because we're not neutral? Mm -hmm. And that's fair enough. That's the game that we play. We'd much rather our national team go further in the competition than you know an individual. But at least there was some representative of Australia. Well, at that particular point in history, Kate, in mm -hmm. your craft as it is, which is uh, refereeing, um, you were one of the top ten people in the world. And that's something, Michael, you and I can never... Ever aspire to? No, that's right. That I, I nearly happen. made it no. once. I was about twelve. No, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a marvelous. That's a marvelous Thank thing. What an achievement! And you're going around again, 2023. Australia's bidding for the World Cup. Yeah, I mean, uh, is that enough that it, it motivation for uh, for a whole raft of uh, generation of, of young referees to, to get involved in the game and uh, and and footballers as well? Yeah. I mean, that what would that mean for for the players and, and for of officials having this the World Cup here in Australia? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't happen that often. So to have it in your in your own home is is would be something special, and the the inspiration that it would it would create. That snowball effect of <clears throat> football, maybe reigniting the love of football, or like creating the love of football in in the next generation, and and seeing what football can produce, and especially with the way the women's game is is changing, um, the landscape's changing. So many professional uh, club competitions are popping up now. So, yeah, if if we were to host it, I, I think it would mean very big things for. I agree, and I, I also would further, further say that if you haven't gone to see a women's game in the W League or, mm. as I've seen in the NPL, etc., you, you're missing out. It's footy played harder, and it seriously is, Michael. Don't look at me with that disbelieving. No, no, I've I've I'm covered a W League games for Fox. It's okay. very entertaining. A glass of bath water for Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, you've got to. I mean, the, the, if you haven't, do yourself a favour. Go there and watch it played live. It might not necessarily be the same standard as the blokes in some respects, but they, they, if you want to see it played hard, this is the one. Before we let you go, Kate, um, it's been truly inspirational and uh, I know there are a lot of young people out there who play the game and my, as my 14-year-old, uh, I'll go home and say to him, mate, uh, if you want to make some pocket money, don't worry about going to work at local Coles. Start refereeing some games. Mm. What, what what would your um, message be? We've heard some great reasons why you should be a referee, but it's always a constant challenge to get kids involved in refereeing our games. So what would your yeah. message to them be? Um, 14, 14, 15-year-olds. Yeah. That's a good time to start. I mean, that was my motivator, the yeah. money. Yeah. Um, my mum was always at the, at, the, at the club, so I was like, well, I could either earn money or mm. I could sit here and twiddle my thumbs or have to sweep. <laughs> um, the, the floor or sweep the change rooms um it, it can be testing as a, as a 14 15 year old because you feel like you're alone mm. uh and like you said the, the the spectators and the parents especially at that age um don't exactly bring a warming environment or something that you want <laughs> to be you don't want to endure that every week uh, and it's hard to keep going back because you do feel alone I was lucky enough that I had a, a, a men not a mentor, but she was a like a referee coordinator mm. at my club, and she um, just was able to help us through those hard times when we had those confrontations. So I guess my message to to young kids is um, try to talk talk to a, an adult that and I, difficult with communication skills, fourteen year old at that at that age to communicate to an adult, but you have someone there like to support you to champion you to to help you through those um those confrontations with with adults um because there's no point a, a, a kid who's 14 15 going up to have a confrontation with with a fully grown adult um and especially when they can't see reason um when the emotions come into it um so go there with someone that you trust uh, and that was a big a big thing for me that she showed me how to resolve conflict at, in a reasonable way, and I was only I was I was very young, but to have that introduction to being like I can talk through this after the match away from emotion, and we can talk about it pragmatically. You don't n understand the power of that as a fourteen-year-old, mm. but you do when you're a, an adult and reflecting back. Oh, that's where I got those skills from. I've got to ask you, Kate. All right, let's let's do a bit of a mock, you know, mock up. Now, Michael and I. <laughs> 
we don't like each other. We never really have. <laughs> now, let's just say I'm going at Michael now mm. because he's better dressed than I am. And I'm reaching across and I'm going to throttle him. How do, how do you arbitrate that? How do you settle me down? I guess I would. I honestly, I, I'd listen. I, I'd listen to what you're saying. He's younger. He's better dressed. Yeah. I'd and listen I, to you. I'd, I'd watch your body language okay. and I'd, I'd listen to your tone. Yeah. And I'd, I'd, I'd probably try to use your name. Yeah. And just to be like, you know, in, and interrupt and be like, I under- understand what you're saying, but we can't have it in that tone. Okay. All right. Let's, I'm not yelling at you. No. So why are you yelling at me? I'm not. I'm not. Okay. okay so, so if we can talk <laughs> like this and then we can get to a common ground and be like, right, now tell me what it is you actually want. A suit like that. Right. So where can we get this suit? Michael, no, where did you get this I suit? I don't know. Savers. I know. MJ Bauer. There we go. I'll take you there. <laughs> hey, listen. I know Michael's yeah. going to wrap it up. I never know how long these so-called podcasts go for. He just randomly says, <laughs> but if I may say, uh, you are a ripper, A1, gold medal, bona fide ripper. And, a, and uh, now that I know a little bit more about you and your journey, um, I'm, as a football person, I'm so proud of you. You're Thank lovely. You. Thank you. Nine of the 11 W League finals uh, Kate has officiated. In. I'm tipping it's going to be 10 out of the 12. If she keeps getting them, she'll get it right eventually. <laughs> and we'll right? see her in the A League a lot more. We'll see her on the world stage a lot more. It's been fascinating and uh, so good to, to have you with us today. Thanks thank very you. much. No, thank you for having me. Thanks for watching.